You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is April 10, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, natural killer cells. Our presenter is Dr. Ardi Pandya. She's in the section of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Good morning, everybody. So I'm uh, Arthi Pandya. I'm one of the um, uh, allergy physicians here, as most of you guys know me. Um, we're going to be talking about natural killer cell deficiency today. So I have no disclosures. Um, our objectives today, we're going to talk about the characteristics of natural killer cells, do an overview of natural killer cell deficiency, the clinical syndromes that accompany natural killer cell deficiency, the method of diagnosis for this disease process, and possible treatments. So we're going to start off with a question. What receptor is expressed by NK cells? A, FC gamma R2A, B, FC gamma R2B, C, FC gamma R3A, D, FC gamma R3B, or E, FC gamma R2C? Um, R3A. A. Yeah, very good. So the correct answer is FC gamma R3A. One more question. What cytokine is essential for NK cell development? A, IL-2, B, IL-7, C, IL-8, D, IL-15, E, IL-23, or F, IL-33? Uh, uh, ILC, so B, IL-7? Correct answer is actually IL-15, so the answer is D. So when we talk about natural killer cells, it's important to define what these cell types are as well as consider what their functions are. So NK cells are lymphocytes that function in both the innate and the adaptive part of the immune system. One of their major functions is to mediate antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, and they produce a whole host of cytokines. They also recognize um, a broad range of um, PAMPs or pathogens through their uh, pattern recognition receptors. They're most appreciated for their defense against viral infections as well as tumor surveillance. They do also play a role in immunoregulation, uh, coordination of immunity, as well as modulating autoreactivity. In healthy kids, um, they comprise about 10% of the lymphocytes. So when we talk about additional functions, as compared to their B cell, T cell counterparts, NK cells, from what we know right now, lack rearranged antigen receptors. They do produ produce high levels of interferon gamma very early on. Um, and this is important in their function of fighting off uh, viral infections, and it's also important for other functions as well. They do express receptors um, of several types of MHC one, class one molecules via a receptor that's called killer immunoglobulin-like receptor. So this receptor is expressed here on the plasma membrane of NK cells. Um, the killer immunoglobulin receptors interact with class one molecules and they alter uh, NK cell cytotoxicity through ITIMs. So we know that ITIMs are inhibitory molecules as opposed to ITAMs. Recent studies do suggest that NK cells can exhibit memory um, with previous encounters of antigens, but we don't know the exact mechanisms by which they do that right now. We do know that they participate in antigen-specific immune responses by virtue of ITAMs through receptor CD16 that binds the FC region of IgG molecules. Um, and here we can appreciate, I mean, this doesn't even encompass all of the different types of killer immunoglobulin. So here we can appreciate that there are different types of killer immunoglobulin-like receptors, but it doesn't even encompass all of the different types that there truly exist. So when we talk about different types of NK cells, it's important, it, important to appreciate this terminology um, of dim NK cells or CD56 dim NK cells versus CD56 bright NK cells. And this dim versus bright classification refers to the intensity um, of CD56 on flow cytometry. This distinction will be important for you guys to remember for your allergy boards. 
So when we look at a flow cytometry image here, we see on the left-hand image um, the actual flow image of the NK cell. So you can see that they should virtually express little to none CD3, but they should have a decent um, expression of CD56 molecules. So that's what this left-sided image represents, as opposed to T cells who T cells which, I should say, don't express CD56, but express a high level of CD3. Now we jump over to the histogram. So on the histogram, we can appreciate here that the different types of NK cells here. So when we look at the CD56 DIM, their expression of the CD56 is you know, based on this axis here, it's not as much as the bright cells. However, the CD56 dim cells comprise the majority of the NK cells, and the CD56 bright NK cells comprise the minority of NK cells. So talking a little bit more about these two different cell types, so talking first about CD56 dim NK cells, these are known for their high cytolytic activity, um, and they do cytol cytolysis by two different um, mechanisms. The first is granule exocytosis and then using perforin and granzymes for, for killing. And the second is by use of FASL and tumor necrosis factor related apoptosis. And this um, then induces different ligands and productions of a whole host of cytokines, um, which allows again for cy cytolytic activity. Um, these uh, DIM cells are also appreciated for their ability to do ADCC or antibody dependent cell cytotoxicity. Um, and that's via their CD16 or the FC gamma R3 receptor. As we had mentioned in the flow image, these comprise of the majority of the NK cells, and these are also um, these are also the mature types of NK cells. So on this image here, um, it's this one on the right hand side. So then. Distinguishing that between CD56 bright cells. So CD56 dim cells are known for their cytol cytolytic activity. The CD56 bright cells are more appreciated for their immunoregulatory role. So they have modest expressions of cytolytic granules, killer immunoglobulin-like receptors, FC gamma R3 expression. Um, again, these are the minority of NK cells and they are the immature form. They are thought to be a precursor to the dim cells. So the bright cells are the precursor to the dim cells. When we look at the different um, cell surface expression between CD56 dim and CD56 bright, so up here when we talk about CD56 dim, they express a lot of FC gamma R3A or CD16 killer immunoglobulin-like receptors. So we appreciate how much they express based on this image here. Um, compared to CD56 bright cells, which express more of these CD molecules, including CD2, CD62L, L-selectin needed for um, uh, uh, chemotaxis, and then CD44 as well. So when we talk about NK cell deficiency, true NK cell deficiency is a really rare phenomenon. So if we're appreciating deficient NK cells on flow or something like that, um, it's important to consider a very broad differential for why that could be. These causes, as well as um, other primary immunodeficiencies, are going to comprise the vast majority of why those NK cells would be low. So when we talk about these individually, drugs and toxins are pretty common for this. We all appreciate this with glucocorticoids. If we use specific immunoablative therapies, alcohol salicylates, any medicines that can increase cyclic AMP, prostaglandins, cannabinoids, antimalarials, all of these are known to drop your NK cell numbers. Infections, especially Viral infections are known to uh, deplete NK cells as well. So we can see this especially in HIV as well as hepatitis C. Um, autoimmune diseases, any autoimmune diseases can really uh, decrease your NK cells. Um, here, rheumatoid arthritis is highlighted. Malignancies can do so. And then we'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, genetic disorders and other primary immunodeficiencies can also be exhibited with low NK cells, even though that may not be the primary immune abnormality. So 
as you can see here, there are many, many, many different types of primary immunodeficiencies that have some type of NK cell abnormality um, accompanied with them. So what's important to remember as we go through this table as well as the table on the next slide is that although you do see an NK cell abnormality in these immunodeficiencies, the way to distinguish a true NK cell abnormality versus one of these is knowing that these, def these diseases have some other defect um, that is driving the primary immunodeficiency. It's not the NK cell abnormality that's driving all of the clinical manifestations. So going through this uh, specific table here, we can see that our different types of SCID severe combined immunodeficiencies can result in NK cell abnormalities, some of them especially who are that are linked with um, interleukin-15 abnormalities. We see that IPEX, Bloom syndrome, Fanconi, all of these, including Wiscott-Aldridge, um, can be accompanied with NK cell abnormalities including leukocyte adhesion deficiencies. We have X-linked lymph lymphoproliferative disorders, bare lymphocyte syndrome, hyper-IgM. Um, a whole host of these are linked with different NK cell abnormalities. And we can see, depending on what the NK cell defect is in this disorder, you'll have a specific infection susceptibility depending on what their specific NK cell defect is. So now when we talk about NK cell deficiencies, um, these are some of the features that are kind of um, important to consider when we are thinking about a true NK cell deficiency. So as I highlighted in the previous slides, it's important to remember that if you have a true NK cell deficiency, your NK cell abnormality is going to represent the majority of the clinical um, and immunological abnormalities of the patient. That defect should be stable over time. As we all know, you know, with uh, when we're doing workup for um, immunodeficiency, either outpatient or inpatient, we may see um, variable levels of NK cells on flow cytometry, and then those um, inevitably, as an infection or you know some sort of disease process improves, those NK cells or NK cell abnormality will improve over time. But for a true NK cell deficiency, that defect will remain stable over time. We do have to exclude secondary causes of NK cell abnormalities. So those include all of the ones on the previous slide, um, including drugs, toxins, infections, et cetera. You do have to exclude other primary immunodeficiencies. Again, this is linking back to that first point that those other primary immunodeficiencies um, have some other defect that may include an NK cell defect. But for these NK cell deficiencies, the NK cell abnormality drives the entire clinical picture of the patient. Now, it's important to remember that NK cells are different from NKT cells. So NKT cells will express CD3 as well as CD16 and CD56, but NK cells themselves should be CD3 negative. So when this evaluation is done for NK cell deficiency, we should see a CD3 negative, CD56 positive pattern. Um, in true classical NK cell deficiency, which I'll highlight on the uh, next couple of slides here, um, you should essentially have an absence of NK cells. So again, talking back to when we do a lot of workups for primary immunodeficiency, we may see you know, variable levels of NK cells, including lower levels, but in a true classical NK cell deficiency, you should have an absence of NK cells. And the functional evaluation, so cytotoxicity text testing, for instance, should be repeatable or reproducible over time as well. So all of these features are important to consider when we're talking about true NK cell deficiencies. So talking about the definition of an NK cell deficiency, we kind of highlighted this on the previous slide, that the impact of the NK cells should be the majority of the immune abnormality, they should be fixed over time and not secondary. What we're recognizing more and more is the importance of gene testing for these patients. And, um, you know, between even a couple of years ago and now, we have recognized so many new genes that are associated with true NK cell deficiency. So this data is fluid and coming out, you know, with more and more stuff over time. Um, but the pattern should be inherent and oftentimes should be associated with a genetic mechanism. 
So when we talk about NK cell deficiency, there are two very important subcategories to consider. Um, and for the fellows, this will also be important for board related purposes. So these are the two major subcategories. One is which I was referring to on a previous slide called the classical NK cell deficiency, and the second being a functional NK cell deficiency. So the classical NK cell deficiency um, or shows, I should say, a complete absence of NK cells from your periphery. You also have accompanied NK cell cytotoxicity. Um, and I should say that depending on which kind of classical NK cell deficiency, you know, we, we talk about on the next slides, this statement may be true for certain types of NK cells, which is why it's important to remember that dim and bright classification as we go forward. So for the functional NK cell deficiencies, you will have um, normal or even sometimes um, slightly elevated levels of NK cells in your periphery, but you'll be, it'll be, um, or these disorders, I should say, should have a deficient um, function or deficient cytotoxicity. And there are genes that accompany both of these disorders. Um, again, more and more of that is being recognized over time, but um, we'll kind of see what that represents on the following slides. So this is not encompassing all of the disorders that we're going to talk about, but it was highlighting one of, that, one of the points about the classical NK cell deficiencies that I was talking about on the previous slide. So depending on what your NK cell deficiency for the classical type is going to be, um, GATA2 and MCM4 are well-recognized genes for um, true NK cell deficiencies. Um, so if we're talking about, let's say, GATA2 deficiency, you will have an absence of both CD56 dim cells as well as CD56 bright cells, and of course, accompanied absent cytotoxicity. But when you talk about other subtypes, like let's say MCM4, you may have an absent dim sub subset, but your bright subset may be pres preserved. Um, and that is potentially you know, a testable point, is knowing which one has an absence of dim and bright versus just dim. Um, and of course, for MCM4, we'll talk about in the next slides, but there is an absence of your cytotoxic function. And then this is just showing here for the functional ones that you're going to have presence of both types of your NK cells, but defic deficiency in the cytotoxicity. So classical NK cell deficiency type 1 was a previous classification for one of the most well-recognized NK cell deficiencies. So this stems from GATA2 haploinsufficiency. We know that GATA2 is a transcription factor that allows for survival and maintenance of a variety of hematopoietic cell subsets. Um, but when we look at this deficiency, essentially we should see an abnormality in the GATA2 gene. The clinical manifestations of this um, NK cell deficiency specifically include very severe um, viral infections. So HPV infections, you can get anogenital cancers that can be the cause of death for patients. You can get disseminated life-threatening HSV, CMV, VZV infections. In one of the first patients recognized with NK cell deficiency due to GATA2, aplastic anemia was recognized as a late complication. As we mentioned on the previous slide, you have an absence or loss of CD56 dim as well as bright cells. There has been a family association suggested. But this next point is the kind of more important thing to consider about GATA2. So GATA2 deficiency can present in a heterogeneous way, and it, it, it's a very complex disorder that we're learning more and more about over time. But essentially, this disorder can present in so many different ways, and NK cell deficiency is only one of the ways that you can have a manifestation of GATA2 deficiencies. You can also have a GATA2 deficiency, which is associated with a B cell or dendritic cell deficiency, but have normal NK cell numbers. So what I'm getting at here is that um, again, classical NK cell deficiency is just one of the manifestations of GATA2 deficiency and doesn't, um, doesn't represent every single abnormality that can happen with GATA2. However, what we have seen reproducibly over time is that with patients who have GATA2 deficiency, um, even let's say if you have normal NK cell numbers, most of them have most of them display dysfunction in cytotoxicity. So I think that's an important point to remember as well. 
Um, this picture, I hope you guys can see it okay here, but it kind of represents the heterogeneity of GATA2 deficiency and how head to toe you can have so many different clinical manifestations. So anything starting from embolic strokes, uh, hearing loss, or HSV ulcers. One of the severe manifestations is pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. You can have disseminated mycobacterial infections, pretty severe cytopenias like MDS. Um, you can have genital warts or extragenital warts or lymphedema. So a lot of, lot of different um, manifestations that can accompany GATA2 deficiency. Talking a little bit more about GATA2 deficiency. So there was a study looking at a cohort of 18 patients with um, it was at the time called classical NK cell deficiency one, now just known as, you know, classical NK cell deficiency with GATA2 um, abnormalities. So most of these patients in this cohort had no CD56 NK cells, um, and they were also found to have low numbers of monocytes and B cells, but no effect on their immunoglobulin levels. So nine of those patients were found to have blood, blood cell dyscrasia as either myelodysplasia or leukemia. A couple of patients were also found to have vulvar carcinoma or metastatic, car um, uh, metastatic melanoma, excuse me, cervical carcinoma, Bowen's disease, and one patient had EBV positive leiomyosarcoma. Five of those patients had pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, and the majority of them had some type of severe um, infection that happened. So 78% had a severe HPV infection, 78% had a mycobacterial infection, and then 28% also experienced fungal infections. Five different families had two generations affected, suggesting that this is an autosomal dominant disorder as represented as well by this pedigree. So, when we talk about GATA2 um, insufficiency, we have these two different images here. The one on the left is representing how poor the survival is for these patients, and this, the one on the right here is representing, again, all of the different clinical manifestations that can happen. So you can see here, onset of illness and patients being asymptomatic. That's this first image here in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and you can see that the majority of the, the majority, majority of the patients are going to have manifestations by the time that they're 30. And you can even argue that the patients, the percentage that are asymptomatic significantly drops, you know, between even the ages of 10 to 20. So patients present pretty early in life with the symptoms. Your survival after your onset of illness drops pretty significantly as well, um, depending on the time of diagnosis and, you know, the time period, you know, that the patients are actually like living to. Um, this is also representing a survival curve in terms of just how long these patients live in general. Um, and you can see that there's pretty sharp decline that happens here. And in terms of transplant free survival, we see that that slope is even more sharply declining. The cumulative incidence of transplant kind of increases in the way that this curve shows, but even survival after transplantation currently is shown to be pretty poor um, with that percentage dropping off significantly by year four after transplantation. So this is pretty significant um, in terms of the severity and survival of, of this disease process. So talking a little more about the manifestations of this disease. So in this upper left-hand part of the second image, we can see the different bone cell abnormalities that, um, bone marrow, excuse me, abnormalities that are represented. We can see cutaneous manifestations in image E. In image G, we see that pulmonary alveolar proteinosis represented. In images I and H, we see manifestations of warts. And in image um, N over here, as well as K, we can appreciate lymphedema. And O represents a, one of the more life-threatening manifestations of embolic strokes. So a lot of um, stuff that can accompany GATA2 in insufficiency. So that's everything about um, our first one, which is GATA2 insufficiency. Talking about one of the second, probably most well-recognized classical NK cell deficiency is MCM4 deficiency. 
So we know that these patients who have an MCM4 deficiency only have a partial deficiency in MCM4. And the reason being is because studies where we have a complete MCM4 deficiency has been shown to be lethal in mice and not even recognized in humans for that reason. So what is MCM4? It's part of this protein complex that directs DNA unwinding and polymerization. So in this disorder, we saw on one of the previous slides that there is a deplet depletion of your dim NK cell subsets, but there is some preserved NK cell bright or CD56 and uh, bright cells. However, I think it's important to know that, you know, we recognize that the survival of overall GATA2 patients is poor over time. We don't know the exact trajectory for MCM4, but I think one of the points for us to just think about is that, um, you know, we, we know that the bright subset is a naive subset and the dim is a mature subset. So could these patients over time have a complete loss of NK cells? That's certainly possible. We just don't have enough um, retrospective data yet to know the answer to that question. But anyway, so that's just an important point to consider here. The, the original report of MCM4 deficiency with NK cell deficiency was recognized in a large consanguineous I Irish cohort. Um, and these are some of the highlighted clinical manifestations here. So recurrent EBV lymphoproliferative disease, recurrent viral infections. You can have intrauterine growth, growth retardation as well as postnatal growth retardation, adrenal insufficiency, and short stature. So all of these are manifestations of MCM4 deficiency. So I was highlighting a little bit on the function of MCM4, and essentially the important point to just know is that MCM4 is important for preserving DNA integrity um, and is um, there to help the unwinding process. But in this whole host of things, that's what the function of MCM4 is. So how does MCM4 kind of look like on flow cytometry with regards to CD3 and CD56? So this left-sided image on the flow represents a normal patient. So a normal patient, again, so these, this portion on the left-hand part of the left-hand image represents the NK cells. So again, the NK cells should be very low to absent CD3 numbers, and you should have a good representation of CD56 with those cells. So you can see here that they have a hefty amount of dim cells, scarce but present amount of bright cells, and then normal T cells with your with this portion on the right side here. So this is a normal patient. Now we talk about a patient that's affected with MCM4 deficiency. So you see this loss of CD56 dim cells here, but what we've recognized is the patients that have previously been identified have a preservation of this bright cell subset and then preservation of their T cells as well. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so now I'm going to talk, so those previous two that I talked about, the uh, GATA2 and MCM4, again, those are going to, those are recognized as the majority of uh, classical NK cell deficiencies. Now I'm going to talk about some of the even more rare causes and some of the more recent genes identified with NK cell deficiency. So RTL1 deficiency um, is another recognized cause of classical NK de cell deficiency. So it is a deficiency in the regulator of telomere elongation helicase 1. RTL1 is an essential helicase crucial for telomere maintenance and DNA repair. So this deficiency accompanied with the NK cell abnormalities was recognized in a 23-month-old female who presented with severe life-threatening VZV encephalitis and unfortunately did not live long past the manifestation of this VZV encephalitis. What was recognized is that there was a biallelic mutation, um, is that there was a mutation of this RTL one. Um, but when we talk about other um, diseases accompanied with RTL1, we recognize that there's biallelic mutations in patients with this HH or Horial Hardierson syndrome. Sorry if I mispronounced that. But in patients who do have biallelic mutations of RTL1 with this HH syndrome, we recognize these specific cl clinical manifestations. So severe dyskeratosis congenita, bone marrow failure, intrauterine growth retardation, developmental delay, cerebellar hypoplasia, and short telomeres. So pretty severe manifestations. 
This is another um, recognized cause of NK cell deficiency is GIN-S1. So this was recognized from five patients from four different families with clinical manifestations including intrauterine growth retardation, chronic neutropenia, and NK cell deficiency. These patients also had preservation of their CD56 bright cells um, and had a low amount of CD56 dim cells. So this GINS complex is required for the function of MCM helicase, which we recognized is important for preserving um, DNA, uh, DNA essentially. So all of so those essentially have this have similar functions. Um, and in four out of five of the patients that were recognized to have NK cell deficiency and this GIN S1 deficiency, four out of five of them were found to have severe um, BCV and CMV infections. And then two of them had disseminated um, CMV infections with bullous skin eruptions. This is a very testable um, thing. So just want to highlight on that for the fellows. So uh, one of the other uh, classical NK cell deficiencies is from IRF8 deficiency. So this was originally described in a family in 1982 um, that had progressive and fatal EBV infections due to lack of NK cell cytotoxicity. So the, the point for um, us to remember as immunologists is that there's a biallelic mutation in IRF8 that allows for this disorder to even happen in the first place. Um, patients who have like heterozygous mutations, for instance, do not have severe clinical manifestations. So it is a biallelic mutation that causes this disease process. So talking about the clinical manifestations, there were three siblings who were recognized to have pretty severe prolonged EBV infections with hospitalizations and mycobacterial infections are also a well-recognized clinical manifestation. Um, as described with some of the other NK cell deficiencies, there was a decrease to absent dim NK cell subset, but increased or normal bright NK cell subset. Um, important point to remember about IRF8 um, is that the expression is induced by IL-15, as we highlighted, is a very important cytokine needed for NK cell maturation. Um, so again, biallelic mutation, in IRF8 can result um, in impairment of NK cell maturation and can result in this entire disease process. So that's everything about the classical NK cell deficiencies, talking a little bit more about functional NK cell deficiencies. So this is a different, um, you know, different type of disease compared to the previous ones in that there are normal NK cell numbers in your periphery, but they are functionally disabled. So you really have to have a high suspicion of this disorder to prompt you to even do the appropriate testing to diagnose this disorder. We do know that the patients recognized with functional NK cell deficiency have a pretty high susceptibility to HSV infections. So it's not just that they have, um, you know, pretty protracted courses with those. It's that they also have a high susceptibility to HSV-1 infections and an abnormal uh, susceptibility to other viral infections, including EBV, VSV, HPV. Um, and of course, these patients are noted to have more complications from these infections as well. We still don't entirely know the mechanism for this subset. There is one gene mutation that is recognized with functional NK cell deficiency, which I'll talk about on the next slide, but we still don't entirely understand the mechanism for how that gene interplays with these clinical abnormalities. We also do recognize at this juncture that there are functional NK cell deficiencies without recognized gene mutations, and this is kind of an evolving thing right now. So when we talk about the functional NK cell deficiency that has a gene defect. It's a gene defect in this gene right here, FCGR3A gene, which encodes CD16. So this is kind of our current understanding as to how this gene may interplay with functional NK cell deficiency. 
maybe not explain every single part of it, but this is our current understanding of how this happens. So CD16, as we talked about on the previous slide, is an NK cell IgGFC receptor, enables antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. So what happens is because of this gene abnormality, there is an alteration in the distal immunoglobulin domain of the extracellular portion of CD16. Note that that doesn't mean that you can't have binding to CD16, but um, it may change what I'm about to talk about here. So the mutation doesn't affect antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. So talking to that point that it's still able to, you're still able to have binding with that, but it impairs your CD16 from being able to be used as a co-stimulatory receptor when CD2 is ligated for spontaneous cytotoxicity. So important point to remember, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity is not affected, but NK cell cytotoxicity is affected. What we recognize here is that CD2 binds to CD58 and CD48 expressed on malignant and EBV infected cells, and the ligation from, or CD2 ligation is used by CD16 to amplify um, signals and, and, and further, like I said, um, further functions of it. So that ability is lost in functional NK cell deficiency one. Again, the mutation does not evade the surface expression of CD16, nor the total binding of it, but it destroys the epitope, epitope present in the distal immunoglobulin domain recognized by anti-CD16 monoclonals, um, causing a mutant, or yeah, causing a mutant CD16. So, um, when we talk about functional NK cell deficiency, one, again, this deficiency as recognized with a gene defect, it was described in three unrelated families, one of which had severe recurrent HSV stomatitis and recurrent hepatic Whitlow. Another had progressive EBV infections and severe systemic VZV infections. And another patient had EBV-driven monocentric Castleman's disease, which is well known for its um, in, uh, lymph node hyperplasia, uh, giant lymph node hyperplasia, andiofollicular lymph node hy hyperplasia. And this patient that had this monocentric Castleman disease also experienced recalcitrant uh, cutaneous warts. All of these patients had decreased spontaneous NK cell cytotoxicity, but none had abnormal ADCC, as we talked about. So, now talking a little bit about diagnosing NK cell deficiency. So it starts off as anything in medicine with a strong clinical suspicion of the disorder um, and making sure you've considered other conditions um, as we talked about with those secondary causes you need to rule out, even considered other primary immunodeficiencies. All of those have to be ruled out first. Then you quantify your um, NK cells by flow cytometry. Let's say those NK cells are absent. Um, they should be repeatedly absent on multiple checks. And um, secondary cause, again, should be considered and excluded. And they should also represent a fixed abnormality in your cytotoxicity testing. So if all of that is present and you know, you're pretty sure that it could be a cl classical NK cell deficiency, you can further support this by doing gene testing. Let's say you have presence of NK cell deficiency, but you still have a strong clinical suspicion due to, let's say, a history of very severe viral infections very early in life, very you know, recalcitrant infections, for instance. So let's say that clinical suspicion still exists despite the presence of NK cells on repeated checks. Now you perform cytotoxic testing, which we'll talk about a little bit on the later slides. Um, and this cytotoxicity testing, it's important to note that this has to be reproducible, specifically what's recommended in the most recent you know, articles regarding NK cell deficiency is that you have to repeat it at least three times and show three fixed abnormalities without any other confounding factors to be able to say that, okay, it could be a functional NK cell deficiency. And again, then you can say, let's support this with further um, you know, gene testing, for instance, um, but that's kind of the methodology to diagnose a functional NK cell deficiency. So um, this is a little more encompassing table about with, with regards to all of those different genes that we talked about um, for the classical NK cell deficiencies, as well as um, the functional NK cell deficiencies. Um, 
as well as the different levels, whether there are dim cell subsets present in any of the disorders, whether bright cells are present, what's going on with the NK cell function, and what the clinical manifestations are. Um, I will for sure give this PowerPoint to you guys. Um, and for the fellows, this table came in super handy for me when I was studying for boards. Um, oh, and the other thing to know is that in terms of autosomal dominant, right now, the only one between all of these different disorders that's recognized is GATA2. All of these other ones are postulated to be autosomal recessive at this point. So how do we, how do we perform cytotoxic cell testing? It's through this current methodology of a chromium release assay with chromium-51. So you have your target cells incubated with chromium-51, um, for instance, and you mix those with an effector cell, which in theory should, you know, allow that target cell to be affected and release your um, chromium-51 from the cells. After that point, you perform centrifugation, as demonstrated here, here. And then this right side is kind of just talking about the same, same thing as this, as this left side. So depending on the release of the chromium from the cells, that kind of represents your cytotoxic either function or dysfunction, um, which can be further quantified and then determined whether you actually have a, a cytotoxic dysfunction or not. So again, going back to diagnosing an NK cell deficiency, what would prompt your suspicion at this point? I mean, I highlighted on the severe viral infections here, but some of the other things that can prompt your suspicion include um, severe mycobacterial infections that present very early in life, um, possible um, lymphoproliferative manifestations as well, if we're talking about GATA2 insufficiency. But in general, you know, what's similar between all of these disorders is pretty severe um, and recalcitrant viral infections. So then we perform our lab testing with the flow. Um, and again, those abnormalities are fixed on the flow cytometry. You perform cytotoxic testing. Here I'm just highlighting that this is the preferred method of um, cytotoxic testing is this chromium release assay using chromium um, 51. Um, and again, this assesses the overall ability by lytic granule secretions, again, by seeing how much of this um, chromium 51 is released from the cells and highlighting just one more time that if it is abnormal, a lot of things can affect cytotoxic testing, including ha handling of the samples, um, the way that the testing is performed, the way that the testing is collected. So because that there's because there are so many variables and things that can affect this testing that should be repeated on multiple occasions to ensure that the abnormality truly exists. And then, you know, these the NK cells can also be stimulated with different interleukins to assess for cytotoxic um, activity too. Um, mutation analysis for gene defects, many different ways that this can be performed and then to make sure to exclude any other causes of NK cell deficiency. So treatments at this time are limited for these disorders, and this is just currently what we know about how we can manage these patients. Unfortunately for the majority of these patients, um, the life trajectory is not so great and survival curves are not great. And that's not just including GATA2, that's you know, including pretty much all the NK cell deficiency patients. But in any case, immunizations um, are important for these patients. So remember that your T cells and B cells um, for true NK cell deficiency should not be affected. So you're sa safe to give these immunizations and consider um, HPV vaccination for sure and VZV on um, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, this is a theoretical concern of whether VZV can cause disseminated infections for patients who have NK cell deficiencies. There are no cases reported from that um, so far, so it's more of a thing as a practitioner or a clinician to just think about. Um, unfortunately, there's not good data to guide us one way or another on who and when to give these VZV infections. Of course, antiviral prophylaxis is gonna be important for these patients um, against the herpes infections, all, all of these viral infections. Um, in GATA2, um, heparin insufficiency, also remember to consider MAI prophylaxis. Um, and then accept, assess exposure to previous viruses by antibody and PCR testing. 
Um, in terms of immunoglobulin replacement, this is obviously, um, you know, it's right now it can be considered for those who have had a life-threatening infection, but this is more anecdotal for us to kind of think about. We don't know how the immunoglobulin replacement would even help these patients because in theory, you should have normal B cell numbers, you should have normal plasma cell numbers, you should have normal immunoglobulins. So it's not a perfect therapy for sure to give for these patients, but again, it's written in articles as a consideration to do for life-threatening infections for these patients. So don't know that that's there. And then adjuvant therapies, including um, interferon alpha 2b, um, can be considered as well. Um, as we had mentioned, uh, stem cell transplant um, is also a considered therapy for these patients. Um, however, we noted that with the GATA2 patients, even then with the stem cell transplants, they have poor survival. Okay, so I'm going to finish off with a couple questions. Um, or actually, do we have time to do these questions? It, it should be fine. I think okay. one of us is presenting, so. Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so question one here. NK cells recognize target cells in a cytotoxic assay by which of the following mechanisms? A, absence of CD16, B, absence of NKP46, C, absence of MHC1, or D, absence of MHC2? Uh, C, absence of MHC1, they should react. Very good, that is absolutely correct. Question number two, which of the following are characteristics of NK cells? A, NK cells require two signals to kill targets. B, NK cell function is regulated by a balance between inhibiting and activating signals. C, CD56, right, NK cells have potent cytotoxic activity, and D, NK cells express somatically rearranged receptors. Uh, it should be B because of the curves, right, the curve system. Yeah, very, very good, as we highlighted, yeah, in those early on slides. So just as a reminder, your CD56, right, don't have potent cytotoxicity, that's going to be your CD56 dim cells. Again, the bright cells are known more for their immunoregulatory role. And remember that we don't, rec right now, we don't know the mechanism by which NK cells have immunologic memory, but we know that, you know, at this time, we don't recognize that they have rearranged receptors. So, very good. All right, I think this is the last question. Um, GATA2 deficiency is a complex disease with manifestations involving hematopoietic and lymphatic development. It is often identified in adolescence or adulthood with cytopenias and or infections. Signs and symptoms that could lead to early consideration of GATA2 deficiency include A, HPV, mycobacterial infections, and monocytopenia, B, RSV infections, staphylococcal pneumonia, and monocytosis, C, influenza infection, aspergillus, and thrombocytopenia, D, adenovirus, bordetella infection, and anemia, or E, CMV infection, streptococcal infection, and lymphocytosis. Uh, should be A, because those are all within the cytoplasm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Very, very good. All right, so I think that is it. Um, thanks for listening, you guys, and allowing me to present today. Does anybody have any questions about anything?